So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our talk. And we are going to be discussing how to incrementally integrate QA, or quality assurance, onto your Agile team, especially a, a Drupal Agile team. Um, I'm Shanley Supal. Uh, this is Everett Zufeld. I am a co-founder of My Planet Digital uh, and a team member there right now. Yeah, and my name's Everett, like Shanley said. I'm a technical architect at My Planet, um, and I've been there almost two years now. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, I think we'll just, My Planet is a digital product company. We're in Toronto, we're in Markham actually at the moment, but in four weeks we will be in Toronto in our brand new office. We're all pretty excited about that. Uh, what does My Planet do? My Planet helps organizations to build great digital products. Uh, and what does that really mean? It means we build products for companies, we provide some levels of professional services, uh, particularly around the Drupal space, but more and more moving into different types of digital platforms. We use open, open source technologies, lean agile UX, and agile project management to build and deploy great products and to teach our clients to do the same thing. And like always, my planet is hiring. So if you're looking for something new or you think that what we talk about, our journey and how we've improved quality on our team sounds like the type of place you'd like to be involved, come and find us afterwards. So what we wanted to talk about today is really a journey where we came from, how that happened, where we are today with quality on our teams and where we're headed in the future because we think that this is a journey and it's, you don't arrive at a team that has great quality, you're continuing the process of evolving quality and how that works on a team. And why do we value quality? We value quality because it helps us to have pride in the work we do and it helps to delight the customers that we have with the products that we build. Uh, so I said I was at my, I've been at my planet for two years now, or almost two years, and when I arrived at my planet, uh, well, let me give you, let me describe a situation and, and I assume there's lots of software developers and Drupal developers here today, so you can tell me if this sounds like a situation that you've experienced. There was a Git repository with a master branch and all of the members of the team continuously integrated their code, which is to say they merged all of their code into one branch and hoped that it didn't break anybody else's. Uh, there were no test cases written for stories. There were no test cases written in code. There were no test cases written anywhere. Developers decided they were done by just saying, I think I'm done. Um, all that code got pushed out to an integration environment and every so often, if it was every few days or every couple of weeks, depending on the project, the product owner would say, hey guys, do you think we can promote this to QA? And there was a bit of a red light, green light, and mostly yellow light session where everybody just said, eh, I'm pretty sure this won't tragically break something that's already there. And then we'd hit the button to, now granted, we had a cool Jenkins setup, so there was a single button you could push to promote the code. So we got that part right. But having any confidence at all around promoting that code didn't exist. Uh, this obviously caused us problems and by the laughter I can tell that we're not the only people that have experienced this. And I hope that you're not currently working someplace where you do experience it, but okay, but if you are, I, we're hoping to share with you how we got to a better place. Uh, and I think that you'll notice when we come to the end of our talk, uh, things have come full circle. Uh, continuous integration actually isn't a bad thing done right. Uh, and so we're hoping that we can get to a, we're hoping that we can show you how to get to that place as well. One of the values of Agile says that we've come to value people and interactions over processes and tools. And it also says we still value processes and tools. Um, we develop processes to help us increase our quality. And we believe in process and we believe in a standardized way of doing things. But I think the key takeaway is that we do not believe that a director of technology or a CTO or a functional manager, that's not how we got our quality process. We didn't have somebody go to a conference on quality or go to a Drupal camp where people were talking about quality. They did not then come back to our company and point a finger at teams and tell them a new way that they would be doing things to increase quality. We know that that would typically not work. We have engaged 
uh, and really creative people that we work with, they don't typically respond well to being told how they're going to work. What they do respond well to is a challenge and a meaningful challenge at that. So when we describe and observe, really using the scientific method, that there is a problem with quality, that there is a problem with customer delight, and then if we leave it to our teams to autonomously solve those problems for themselves, we have found that what emerges is process that works for the team. And that's really, that process is what has allowed us to go from where we, are to our, where we were to where we are. So we started, like I said, with everybody smashing code into one repository. So one of the process improvements that we made was creating branches for different features. We started with absolutely no review at all, really people just guessing at what they were supposed to build and building it and hoping that it matched what should have been built. And so we added a process where developers were required before anything else. And I think key is that the developers were required to create tests before they started to do implementation. So not a business analyst writing a test to say this is what should happen, but the developer understanding the story, understanding what's required, working with others to refine the understanding, and then writing tests before they do implementation. We started with no review of that functionality and no review of the code and no review of the interactive design or interaction design. And we added in a process where the functionality and the design and the code would all be reviewed by somebody before that piece of work being considered done. And these tools, these processes, and there's overhead to them, are the types of tools and processes that allow us to build confidence in what it is we're building so that we can say at the end of an iteration or coming to the end of a release that we actually feel confident about what we've built. And then near the end of a release, we've integrated, uh, sometimes more than not, release testing, where we test that which we've built to ensure that all of the pieces that work fine on their own are continuing to work correctly when integrated with each other. And that's really the process, that's how we got to where we are, but it's really important to understand that it wasn't dictated. It emerged from teams trying to solve problems that they themselves had observed and that were causing themselves pain. The number of times that you can work on an issue to fix an IE8 bug without wanting to lose your mind uh, is limited. So if you could just not create IE8 bugs in the first place because you have some processes in place to allow that, to ha allow those bugs not to happen, that's a, that's a much more satisfying experience for a developer. So I'll just touch on some of the, uh, sorry, practices that we eventually implemented on our team as well. So pair programming, that's one of the most important quality tools that we implemented. It allows teams of developers, well, two people on a sub-team to work together to ensure that what's going on meets everyone's shared context and that we're both contributing the best parts of our Sorry, uh, we're both contributing the best parts of our know-how in terms of how to build quality products. We also have gone with test automation and uh, TDD, BDD, which I'll be actually giving you a demo of. Uh, some people it'll be old hat, uh, and some people it'll be mind-blowing. If you haven't seen BDD before, I promise you, you'll be in the latter camp. So I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, in this part of the presentation about Agile and why we decided to do the things that we did. Why did we choose process? And some of the other decisions that we made, why we made them and how they relate to Agile. So this is the Agile Manifesto. Uh, who has never seen the Agile Manifesto? Okay, so the Agile Manifesto, uh, some of the parts that maybe you would have a, an issue with what we've just talked about is, Specifically, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Uh, that is, we have come to value uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So why was that decision really made? So I'm gonna start to answer that question by looking at a compare and contrast between Agile and Waterfall at the very basic level. So this is a really reductive example of what Agile is, but we come together, we plan a chunk of work, we work in iterations, and then we deliver our working code. 
But I would even go farther than that. And I think that Agile, really to me, this is Agile. If you just do this, this is Agile. Uh, inspect and adapt. You do some work, you look at what happened, you, you know, decide to make some improvements, and then you do it again. So now here's a really reductive explanation of what waterfall is. Um, and you know there are a lot of great waterfall processes, uh, or sorry, sophisticated waterfall processes, uh, like RUP, but really this is what it is. You do detailed planning, you have some business analysts who come up with a set of requirements, uh, then that goes to design, that goes to production, that goes to testing, and when you find a problem it goes straight back to the beginning. So, I mean, there are a lot of problems with this and we're all very familiar, but how this uh, really relates to QA in particular is this is really a game of telephone. It's a game of, you know, when uh, you were a kid you used to have a, a line of kids and someone would speak into the ear of the other and then vice, or it would continue along the line and then the last kid would say, you know, I heard elephants want to eat spaghetti and uh, the the point of the game is to show you how easy it is to have a breakdown in communication. And I think that eliminating that is actually key to um, improving quality. So uh, I guess at my planet, this is one of our fundamental company philosophies that creating digital products is a multidisciplinary process. Also, we should embrace diverse methods and interdisciplinary methods of working where they make sense. And this is actually how we work at my planet. So on the slide here, we have a developer, a product owner, and a designer. And this is how we work on our day-to-day -day work. We have everyone sitting around a table discussing what needs to be done. And that really improves quality because it allows us to share context, share the vision. So how does this come into uh, QAs? You can see here, this is our team structure. Uh, we have typical scrum teams that you would expect a scrum master product owner, and then some team members. But we also have what you might see TRs and CRs, technical reps and creative reps. So people who provide leadership on those issues. And I think that leadership is key. Uh, you can't uh, say I want quality out of teams and not give them what they need to succeed. You have to plant the seed of what you want to grow. So it's not management, it's leadership. And these people provide leadership. So we then began to introduce QA reps because I think that a lot of people who are familiar with Scrum are familiar with the idea of tech reps and creative reps. We also uh, created QA reps. So essentially what we have now are our typical Scrum teams with QA reps injected into the mix. And this led to some problems. So here are some cheesy jokes to illustrate what I'm about to talk about. So the developer says to a QA, there's no I in team, and the QA says to the developer, but we can't spell bugs without you. Dun -dun -dun. Um, and how many testers does it take to fix a light bulb? And this is the most biting one. The answer is none because testers don't fix problems. Um, so this really kind of illustrates the fundamental conflict that developers tend to have with QA people. And I have, we joke about it, but I've witnessed some true disrespect between these two disciplines, who are, which are both vitally important to producing quality products. So embedding QA leadership is actually crucial. Making QA part of the team. So what are the benefits? You get a cross-pollination of ideas. So QA now has understanding and a respect for what development does and vice versa, but also the mentalities are shared so that the team can work with a, with a QA mentality. Furthermore, it actually improves ownership of the product because now the team is empowered to actually achieve what they need to from a quality perspective. It's not gonna get kicked out and then kicked back to them by some external party. So I guess what I've been trying to get at is this. Context is king when it comes to quality. I've read very recently a, a book on Agile specifications and it talks about what is customer delight. Customer delight is really when the customer's expectations match up to what you've delivered. So in order for everyone to have a shared understanding of what the customer's expectations are, you need to share the context. So a QA that is uh, on the team actually is improved at doing their job. 
So they actually know what the acceptance criteria are. They don't just read and execute tests and do exploratory testing. Um, they can help share the mentality and share techniques for improving the team's quality. So what are the outcomes of embedding QA into the mix? First of all, team ownership, and I can't stress this enough, just like any kind of high value creative work, the team needs to feel ownership in order to feel like that they want to do something about this. Um, so the whole team becomes QA minded. So the entire team now understands what kind of things they need to look for when they're doing QA. Oh, what's the importance of cross-browser? How much does this actually cost? How does this relate to the, the end user's goals? And reduce cost. I think this is a well-known thing that the later in a life cycle that you catch a bug, the more expensive it is to fix. Um, and a superior product. And I'll, I'll give you this example. So I've been working with Drupal for about four years now, done lots of uh, very large Drupal projects. And the current project that my team is working on is a Drupal-backed Angular front-end um, kind of configuration for services, for subscription services. And as you may or may not be aware, Angular is very, very new JavaScript tech. Uh, JavaScript tech. So it doesn't play well always with IE8, especially the ways that we're pushing it to do what we want to do. We have zero escape defects to our integration environment for IE8. Zero. And that's because the entire team has the tools and is empowered to find those bugs and has been taught how to find those bugs. So uh, customer delight, as I, I just mentioned, customer delight really is when the customer's expectations match what you deliver. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about the future and I'll hand it over to Everett to talk about our inspect and adapt. Yeah, thanks. So I, I'll, I'll go back and, and mention customer delight maybe a little more. This is the goal. So the goal of building a great digital product is not writing the next coolest JavaScript function. And the goal of a great, building a great, the goal of building a great digital product is not even about making lots and lots of money, though that's an awesome side effect. The goal of building a product is to delight the person who's using the product. And how do we do that? How does a QA person know how to, how, what the customer is looking for? Well, obviously some talks with the customer, but the closer they are to the team that's building the product and the closer they are to the customers, the more information they have, like Shanley pointed out, context is king. That's how they're going to know. How can a team improve, a whole team, including QA, including technical and creative and business analysis, how can that team improve? By getting itself cognitively close to the problem. How, by reading a book, you know, hey, I read a book, that'll help. But grappling with the problems, observing the problems, guessing sometimes at ways of solving them, and then just trying it out, and, and sometimes we fail, and sometimes we succeed, but we always learn in the process. So we talked about inspect and adapt, and that's exactly what our team does. Currently, our team uh, works on two-week iterations. So we will begin a week, we'll begin an iteration on a Monday by the team selecting a set of work to complete over the two weeks. And I want to make that a really clear distinction there. No manager comes to our team and says, here is the amount of work that you will complete in the next two weeks. And I'll say that again, nobody tells us how much work we will complete in the next two weeks. Our team indicates, based on our experience, based on looking at our past performance, how much work we believe that we can complete in the next two weeks. And we could probably do more work at a lower quality if we were forced into that situation. But we are the control valve. We get to determine how much work we believe we can actually complete to a state of doneness, a, of appropriate doneness over the course of a two-week iteration. So we plan the work and we begin to do the work. And, and Shanley mentioned pair programming. That's something we've been experimenting with. We, we've been experimenting with it for a few months on and off, but we're really starting to ramp up pair programming. But I'd, I'd remove the word programming and I'd relate, re replace it with paired product development, because there's no reason in a pair that a QA analyst who maybe be less development-centric might pair with a developer, 
or a designer might pair with a developer, or a business analyst might pair with a designer. It's pairing people, the, a couple or sometimes two or three of the people that are most helpful at solving a particular problem together. So it doesn't just have to be about passing a keyboard back and forth to write code. It can be about trying to ask ourselves the questions together, how could this experience be improved? And a developer saying, oh, well, that would make it a much better experience, but it takes four times as long to implement. If we change this one part, could it still be a really good experience and take half the time? And, and we work together to make those decisions. We also work together on improving our team. Uh, back in September, I say back in last month, our team decided it, we've been growing and we've been learning and we've been improving and, and a lot of it was reasonably ad hoc. Somebody would pop up an idea and we'd try it out and another idea we'd try it out and we thought, could we come up with a system, and that's been working, but we asked ourselves if we could come up with a system for improvement that might be a little more structured. And so we all decided to sit down and read the book Extreme Programming Explained. And extreme programming was like a hot buzzword 10 years ago probably and isn't that well mentioned now. Now we talk about agile and we talk about scrum and extreme programming is a little bit more in the background. So what, do we, what is extreme programming? And it's an agile methodology that is highly prescriptive about technical practices and principles uh, that can be used for software development, but let's replace software with digital product development. We can use this set of practices to increase the quality and the productivity of a team that's building digital products. Does our team believe that extreme programming is a golden hammer? And the answer is absolutely not. Do we think that if we become an extreme programming team, we will have solved all challenges related to digital product development? No. Why are, we, why are we pursuing extreme programming? And the reason that we're doing it, and the same reason that we pursue any type of improvement, we want to get better at what we do. We want to build better digital products at a higher quality, at a higher rate of productivity, and we want to enjoy ourselves more as we do it. And we believe that the journey of learning about and experimenting with the practices of extreme programming will help us to see those types of improvements. Again, I want to take back to the comment about this is not directed. We did not have a director or a, or a chief technology officer or a manager come and plop down a stack of extreme programming books and tell us that we were going to become an extreme programming team this quarter. We said we recognize in ourselves opportunities for improvement and we as a team want to improve and we have the benefit of some leadership embedded in our team that can help us, guide us in the right direction and help start the right types of conversation to help that improvement happen. And then we went to management, we went to the people that run our company and we said, hey, you know what we're interested in doing this quarter? We want to try to become an extreme programming team because we believe that in the journey we will learn great things and improve our quality and productivity. And management went, wow. Absolutely, Go, the, you didn't even need to ask us, but thanks for letting us know and let us know how it works out. And so what are we looking at next? Next, we're looking at things like more test-driven de development. We're looking at things like more communication, higher volumes of collaboration so that everybody understands what we're building, every, that there's an easy way to assert that we've built what we said we were going to build, and we're looking at mechanisms to ensure, reinforce that inspect and adapt feedback loop so that as we try new things, we can evaluate it. And a lot of times those evaluations are qualitative or anecdotal, but that we can evaluate it and decide whether or not we need to change, do more of it, or do less of it. Um, one of the things that I think that Shanley was going to is going to demonstrate is some of our test automation. So I'm not going to tell you that we have 100% automation on our code. We don't have full unit test suites. We don't have full, you know, we're experimenting with this to see what type of value it brings us. And where we find it bringing value, we do more of it. And when where we find it not bringing us value, we do less of it. Um, so maybe Shanley, do you want to give, do that experiment or show that demonstration? Sure. Um, before I get to the demonstration, I'll just kind of bring it back full circle. 
when we started, I think I'm done. What does that actually mean? It meant very little. And now, through our efforts, this is what I think I'm done means. It means that people understand what done means. They have the confidence that they can execute on that, and they have the tools to support them in making that decision. So uh, I'm just going to run a quick demo of uh, Behat. Who has never seen Behat? OK, so uh, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to drag my IDE over here. I hope. Yeah. So this is really what Behat is. It's a behavior-driven development tool. Behavior-driven development is an agile tool or an agile methodology which focuses on involving all the stakeholders in the requirements process. So again, breaking down those barriers that kind of break up contra uh, context. So you write English language tests. These are very clearly readable by anyone who can read English and it's also translatable. Uh, so for example, here is a feature, it's search resources. As a site user, I want to search the site so that I can find stuff. And I wrote this in five minutes, I'm sorry. Um, and we have various scenarios. So using a story format, given some uh, preconditions, when I do some stuff, then something should happen. Example is for search, given I go to resources, when I fill in edit search block form two, gotta love you Drupal, with agile, and I press edit submit, then I should see practical advice for the Agile Manifesto. Now the magic of Behat is that anyone can write these, but these are automatically generated or run against the actual application. So I'm just gonna bring up the <laughs> terminal here. And you just run the suite And I hope that it's going to pop up on this window. It's not. And Behat will actually run all of the tests for you and actually do the things that you said. You know, when I go to this page, when I fill in this, when I press these buttons. So I wrote these tests in about five minutes, and they're testing, you know, the login, logout functionality, the search functionality of our site. Uh, these are the kinds of tests that all developers write at MyPlanet. Uh, we start with English language and then in this syntax, and then you must run all of your, uh, all of the existing feature suite before your story will pass. It, it's a rudimentary regression testing system. So uh, I think that's what we have to show you. Oh, and of course the browser windows are popping up on this window. Sorry about that. Um, so we can take questions now at this time.